Firstly, I'd like to introduce our panellists, or rather I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and provide a very quick bit of context to understand where they're coming from and where their interest lies in this debate. I'd like to say thank you as well for rushing your lunch, because I know it's a bit tight at the moment. They say there's no such thing as a free lunch, and this is where you start paying, listening to us. Um, so with no further ado, I'll hand over to Morton to briefly introduce himself. Thank you. I, I th actually thought that the lunch was free, but then I had to leave for this, so, so I didn't get any lunch. Um, but uh, yeah, I uh, work for and represent the Danish uh, licensed online gambling operators, and I also uh, work for an association called International Association of Gaming Advisors. Okay, I'm Francesco Rodan, I'm the director of the online gaming uh, department of the Italian Regulatory Authority. During the last six years, uh, I've been working, uh, I've been helping, uh, helping to shape uh, the, the regulation uh, of the Italian online market. Right now, uh, we have regulated almost uh, all the popular product. We have a complete offer and uh, about uh, 200 uh, licensees. And uh, uh, we have a market size of about uh, 800 million euros in terms of uh, GGR. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Maarten Heijer. I work at the European Gaming and Betting Association, uh, where we represent uh, a number of online companies in the Brussels discussions on regulation and on the sector as well. Um, and increasingly also we are involved at the local level in the regulation of, for instance, the Dutch uh, market and also in the German discussions. Um, so I represent, let's say, the, uh, the online industry's interest at, in this panel as well. Good afternoon, I'm Stefano Sbordoni. I'm an Italian lawyer active in the field uh, since uh, too long, probably, in 1995. Uh, and I've seen uh, people like Francesco starring <laughs> and uh, uh, others that uh, are not there anymore. And uh, even in Europe, uh, I tried to be active in the last 10 years. Good afternoon, my name is Peter Nassens. Uh, I'm, uh, I work for the Belgian Gaming Commission. I'm head of uh, the legal department and we have a regulated uh, online market since 2011. Thank you. And as Dan introduced, we're going to be covering three um, thorny issues, but also what I call the holy grail, either as an operator or a regulator. Um, the harmonization, whether we'll ever get harmonization across Europe or the globe. Enforcement, both of the existing licensees and perhaps more importantly, the illegal operators that are skewing the marketplace. And finally, the issue of shared liquidity. Um, and again, if we can answer those three questions this evening, or this afternoon rather, that'll be a miracle. However, it'll be very interesting to hear the views both of our industry experts, but also two regulators with a huge amount of experience. So we're going to start with harmonization. I'll turn to Martin, um, representing EGBA and the uh, various European <coughs> bodies. At the center of Europe now, so I hope you've got the best grasp of it across a European view. Is harmonization likely to happen? Is it just a dream? Is it even realistic to consider harmonization at all across Europe? Um, it's a very good question. I think if you listen to the previous panels, uh, I'll be a bit more nuanced um, in, in, in compared to what they said. I think harmonization of the sector as such, that you have one sector specific directive which harmonizes market access to all member states, uh, I think is a long way off still. But what you do see that there's quite a lot of European regulation covering more and more gambling. Uh, you already have quite a lot of regulations that are applicable, uh, data protection, unfair commercial practices, uh, and others. Currently, the anti-money laundering directive is negotiated. Um, and you will also see the Commission preparing some recommendations. So more and more of the activities of operators are being regulated by European legislation. And in that sense, I think it's an incremental process. And I think we will sooner or later reach a stadium where either the Commission will make a proposal to, let's say, financial services like a uh, solution, or where the court will say that actually harmonization has progressed so far in this sector that this idea of national licenses per se might not be tenable anymore. So I think either of the two of these processes will win, but I think it's an incremental process and we will get there in time. And when you say in time? 
I mean, I'm, I'm, are we, are we willing to say five years, ten years, twenty years? I think. Well, it will be interesting to see how the Commission will pick up the gambling foul. Uh, there will be a new European Commission from May onwards, a new European Parliament as well. Obviously, they will not from day one pick this uh, up and up and make a proposal. But I think that we likely that they will progress the file further and maybe by the end of them start discussing whether some sort of harmonization is desirable. And, and, and I was going to say, Peter, would you think less harmonization, more about common standards? That would be a better way of moving forward with the debate? I, I, I think may, maybe common uh, standards can be an issue, but what, what the thing is that if you're talking about harmonization and you mean that you had the dream that uh, you will have in a single uh, market where gambling activity is just seen as normal economic activity, I think it will remain the dream. I think gambling is uh, something specific and if you want to find solutions in a harmonized way, you need to build uh, further on what is happening in the member states. Harmoni harmonization has become a negative uh, term. If you see, for instance, in the, in the Fox report, it was an interesting report and an interesting uh, decision of the European Parliament, the word has not mentioned. But on the other hand, implicitly, there is a clear call for harmonization. They are asked, the European co uh, Commission are asking uh, to develop a uh, European e-identification system. They are thinking about European ban on live betting. They are uh, thinking about the notion of illegal that has to be applied uh, across Europe. So there are elements in the report, they are even uh, requesting for a European player, <coughs> uh, for European player limit. So implicitly you feel that there is a, 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 a tendency towards more uh, European, uh, maybe Euro uh, European framework. We also see that, uh, that Francis can maybe tell more about that, that the major countries have decided apart from the expert group, to come together and to talk, and maybe also to, to talk about European issues, you see that there is a movement towards more European rules, and I think it's a good movement, because as a mid-sized country, we see that you cannot solve all the problems in your country. But it would be a mistake if you are not using the experiences, experiences in the countries to build further on. Uh, so in that way, we don't think that, that we could achieve uh, a real harmonization if you are not taking into account the interests of the member states. And turning to Francesco then, um, Peter mentioned the Fox report and earlier today we heard a bit about the um, Kreuzmann action plan. W have those been catalysts in Italy at all? Or of this move, I'm, I'm going to stop using the word harmonization, I'm going to use the words you know, common standards and, and moving forward on that direction. Have they been a catalyst for you? Yeah, first of all, maybe we should define what harmonization actually is. It's uh, something that technically uh, uh, won't ever happen in the gambling sector because, of, for instance, harmonization implies also to harmonize tax rates. And this is not, uh, won't be possible. It probably makes no sense. It makes no difference to have the same tax, tax rates or different tax rates across countries. It's not really important. So maybe we should start thinking of identifying some common standards because the system right now is far from being optimal. Something is trying, uh, uh, is being tried by the European Commission. They set up uh, an expert group. That's a fantastic thing because uh, we have the regulators of 28 countries around the table. We are knowing each other, we are trusting each other, but this is a very painfully slow process. The uh, European Commission will, will uh, issue some uh, recommendations in the first quarter of 2013, they are already late, and those recommendations are just suggestions to the member states that are not binding at all. And they, their plan is to have another year to, to, to see if, if the rec recommendations are implemented and what's the outcome before thinking of possible other next steps. So on that front, everything is too slow. I say too 
because uh, what we are facing right now as regulators is that we are suffering from the fragmentation of standards around Europe or around the world. If I put myself in the clothes of an operator that wants to be compliant with the uh, regulation of Italy, France, Spain, Belgium, uh, Estonia, uh, UK, Nevada, New Jersey, probably it will get crazy. I don't think that most operators have the, the, the economic power to, 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 to succeed in all those markets. Every time they have to face different technical standards, different uh, administrative requirements and so on. So it, it becomes probably unbearable. And that's, uh, that could lead the operators to do some jurisdiction shopping. They would, would invest in Spain because it's a large country and maybe decide to remain illegal in, uh, in Italy. And that's a problem for us. Also, because I have uh, my standards, Peter has its own standards. Which standards are better? probably part of mine and part of uh, his. So that means that my standards are not perfect. I could improve something. That's why it should be really important to, to exchange our experiences, find what's, what works better, and uh, all use, as regulators, the best practices around. But we are discussing a lot about this, but so far, we haven't had any practical results. We are still at discussion stage. And that uh, brings uh, this uh, Stefano, you've got an interesting look on your face there. Would you like to comment? Well, um, the fact is that uh, uh, we have all to be aware that uh, Europe uh, is dying day by day. <laughs> Uh, if we don't do something and gaming is one area that we have to look at because as the power independently from the uh, activity of uh, uh, being uh, uh, of leading a revolution somehow if we look that uh, 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 into details uh, and uh, going to what Francesco was saying we have fantastic people in regulating authorities around the EU. 27 members have probably uh, uh, high, highly rated brains uh, working in there, with no powers at all, with no decisional powers at all, and uh, strangled by their own bureaucracy. So there is such an enormous work done by them, which I do sincerely, and I'm close to the regulator since my very beginning of, of uh, activity, uh, but the enormous work they produce does not lead to a result. The results that have been obtained have been uh, uh, a challenge to two active or illegal operators. That means that uh, 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 reporting a statement uh, the, the law is static and market is dynamic. So it's very difficult for us, for law that is static, to get uh, uh, upfront uh, market. I was going to say, Peter, is that something you recognize from your experience in Belgium? that? Despite your best work, the political will is not there to move across common standards and work not only in um, common standards harmonisation but also enforcement. Is that is that something of your experience, or do you think you've got the necessary power within Belgium to carry out your will? At, at, at the moment, we, we have a problem with our secondary legislation that there is not enough a, a political will to, to implement or to discuss that that uh, secondary legislation. Maybe it will be discussed in the, in, in the next month. But I, I do not agree that, that, uh, that Euro is, is dying uh, because if you're looking in, uh, to America, you, will, you, you see the same evolution. You have to take into account that online gambling market is a new uh, 
uh, market. It's not a stable market. You see lots of mo movement. You see in the future uh, lots of mergers and, and, and so on. You see lots of activity also in, in this conference. You see now new products as virtual betting products. You see the first step towards uh, an online uh, casino experience and, and so on. So there is a lot of movement. And it's normal that, that you, 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 you need some time to find uh, adequate regulatory measures. But there is one thing that is important, and I think it is also important to find European solution, is that each member state starts a proper uh, regulation. We, the operators do, 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 do not have necessarily to complain. We, we have in our country, we have Belgian uh, operators, we have Italian operators, we have French operators, and they can organize a profitable business. So, and I think they are also asking for a stable environment. But that stable environment, therefore you need legislation. It's also in their interest that there is a, a good regulation. And I think it's like Francesco said, it's normal that each country is developing its own common standards. But after a while, if the, the market will be more stable, I think you will see more space for convergence also between, between, between countries. It's more easy for me to talk with Francesco because he's uh, representing a regulator, but some of the countries does not even have one regulator. So you need to give support to regulation within each, co uh, each country, and then you will also come to a European solution. And you see the first signs towards more cooperation between Euro European uh, regulators, and I think operators can support that. I think if you're only <coughs> uh, uh, having the idea that infringement procedure will be part of the solution, then you can wait for years uh, to, to find European solution because you will have a, a battle between, between each other. And there is one thing that, that I, I was wondered in the other discussion this morning, that was the definition of illegal in the Fox report, uh, the, of uh, what is illegal in, in, in Europe uh, or not. I think they have um, hit the right ball to say that you have to be authorized in a country to operate legally in that country. But they have missed the ball if you are saying that you can uh, uh, define the notion uh, uh, illegal by saying ah, you are illegal in one country, so uh, automatically you are also illegal in another country. I think that creates uh, not the trust that is needed between regulators to work together because uh, imagine that we have uh, issued a license, for instance, to an operator for nine years. And after three years, uh, our colleagues from in, in Italy said, "Ah, that the, the, this operator is, is illegal for us." You, you can. We have 28 democracies. Is the, 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 the issuing a license is normally based at a democratic decision of the parliament. So it's a little bit tricky to say that that decision is, is illegal uh, for another country. So that, that's that, that's going to forfeit. But on the other hand, I think it is important. Uh, operators must be allowed uh, by the authorities of a country to operate in that country. And that brings us nice on to the next topic of enforcement. And I guess there are numerous strings that come out there. One is individual country enforcement, and then there's uh, cross-border enforcement. So uh, as Peter was saying, if you're operating legally in Italy, but totally illegally in Curaçao, for example, what is the situation around enforcement? So turning to you, Morton, because you've got away lightly so far. Um, so I thought I'd wake can you I, up. Can I just comment on, on the other thing? Because no, you can't. <laughs> I will Please anyway. Say. I will anyway. Just to be very clear, from my, from my viewpoint, there's never a group of regulators, a regulatory platform, historically have never influenced the gambling industry significantly. And I don't see that in the near future either. The, the changes in the game, gambling industry has come from from countries like Italy that went uh, forward and, and, and privatized the gambling business. It's coming from the ga uh, gambling industry who's at one point will get to uh, common technical standards. And it's coming from uh, the test institutes that are influencing the regulators. So at one point there'll be, uh, there'll be technical standards. Uh, so, and that, that will be adopted by regulators in my opinion. Yes. Yes. Okay, back to your question. Back, sorry, uh, and val valid points, and I don't think we want to go on the technical standards with the, um, the testing agency <coughs> panel, um, and some of the people in this room know my views on those. Um, back, back to, <laughs> indeed, Morton does very well. Um, on the enforcement side of life, uh, looking just at individual countries in the first instance, do you believe there's been enough enforcement taking place, if any, because we are seeing in certain jurisdictions uh, license holders being fined for poor returns or failure to meet criteria 
yet you've got totally illegal operators continuing to operate freely in those jurisdictions. Is, is that a problem with the legislation? Is it a problem because people like Peter and Francesco haven't got the ability or the resources available to do it? I'm, I'm not sure that they don't. I've, I've, I've seen that in each jurisdiction there are widely, quite differently approaches to, to enforcement where, where in, in, in Spain you can be fined uh, I mean, 100,000 uh, euros for, for something which is perhaps not as significant in another jurisdiction. And in, in, in Denmark, no one has been fined yet. And, and if, if they were, it wouldn't have been nowhere near that size. But what, why is that, GB? I think it's, well, it's, it's, it's different legal systems. It's just, it's just not in there. Uh, maybe it should be in there, but, but you, you haven't seen the, the need for doing it anyway. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a matter of proportionality, but um, I think it's, it's, very, it's very new to most jurisdictions and enforcement is perhaps not as vigorous yet as, as it is going to be later. I think you're trying to, to, uh, to divide the operates between the, the, the white sheep and the black sheep uh, before actually imposing uh, very significant fines on the operators. Francesco, as a regulator, where do you stand in the enforcement issue? Um, how, I mean, are you putting a significant amount of resource and ability behind enforcement, or is it, is it something that is your hands are tied on both politically and from a resource perspective? You're right when you say that uh, we usually are good in enforcing the regulation with the licensed operators. They have to pay the taxes, they have to pay the cost of compliance, also they have to pay the cost of enforcement if something goes wrong. When it comes to, to illegal operators, can you quote a single country in the world in which there is no illegal market? US? Don't think so. Maybe UK because uh, for the time being uh, everything is legal there, yeah. or almost everything. So it, it's not possible. It's really hard to, to go outside Italy and, and, uh, and uh, uh, catch the bad people uh, who are suffering uh, uh, illegal gambling uh, uh, to Italy, to the Italian citizens. It's not possible. So the only effective way, is, as usual, uh, is to provide a comparable, competitive legal alternative. And that it would be a natural process to see the, the bad guys turn into good guys, getting the, the national license and uh, uh, operate uh, in a proper way. But otherwise, it's fairly impossible. We, we can uh, use uh, ISP blocking, financial transaction blocking, whatever, but uh, uh, if people want to play those games, they will look for those games. Also, it's even harder because uh, and. Uh, Martin is here, so I can uh, also mention uh, the, the, the lack of cooperation that we are getting from uh, the industry. Probably your, your uh, association works well at the European level, but there is nothing like that uh, at the Italian level. Mm -hmm. The Italian license operators, they are 200, they are the big uh, players, uh, the international players. They usually are more busy in fighting each other busy in competing, busy in pointing their fingers one against the other, is doing that in a bad way, etc. And they're not providing us with the necessary help to find the solutions that would help the, the, the whole industry. But I, I, as, a, as an employer of a large supplier then, what, what would you ask me to do for you? You're saying we're not providing the solution for you. What would you ask? For instance, you, you are providing the very same games, the very same uh, Iron Man slot to the uh, licensed operators in Italy and to the other operators that are, who are actively targeting Italy from outside. Am I? <laughs> That's uh, an example. <laughs> the first that comes uh, to mind. But uh, this would be your business starting Monday, right? <laughs> You may think that. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on, Stefano. Ian, but then we, we get, uh, I, I want to quote Martin again. <laughs> he will speak sooner or later. But uh, uh, EGBA standards, or let's say Decalogue, yeah. 
Well, can it be, I asked to Francesco Morton in his previous life uh, and, uh, and Peter here, is that objectable? Is there something in that Decalogue that doesn't fit with the regulation of each of your own countries? I don't think so. So, before uh, deciding if some operators <coughs> have to be enforced against or not, let's decide why on which basis we do need as a, a political environment of a single EU member state or country or sovereign country do need to enforce against him. Before we have to ascertain why what's the social cost of impact of his illegal activity, then we enforce. And probably this won't lead to harmonization, but at least should could lead to logic to common logics. Uh, maybe uh, because for me it's very interesting to hear that the two are very active regulators asking for more European cooperation on specific areas, but maybe even more in general. And to see that they actually go further than the European Commission goes at this stage, an extremely important uh, conclusion. Uh, hopefully, that also comes out of the discussions that they have with the Commission in, in Brussels, because it, it, I think. If the Commission feels more political support for further progress in this area, it would be extremely helpful. And turning back indeed to standards, I think that's an area where, where it be, should be relatively easy for regulators and operators uh, to agree upon a certain set of standards. Uh, we have the EGBA standards, but there's also a more international uh, group of standards called the SEN standards, of the uh, European Standardization. I think this is something that we could take as operators and as regulators a step further uh, without necessarily be politically extremely contentious. Clearly it would help uh, the regulators, as uh, Francesco just said, it's just expensive um, to enforce your, 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 these rules. It would help the operators because the set of rules is very clear and it necessarily all the laws are the same, but at least the requirements are clear what you need to comply with. So I would really, I mean, if this would be the start of a, a love affair between operators and regulators uh, on standards, I think it would be a very good day, but I think seriously that this is something we can bring further. But who do you think should be leading that? Because I think everyone's in sort of violent agreement that we need sort of common standards, a, a common approach. The regulators say we should be doing more as operators stroke suppliers. The suppliers believe the uh, regulators should be leading with it potentially. I mean, Peter, where do you lie on that? Would you say it's a responsibility of the regulators and the government, or are you looking towards the industry to provide the catalyst? Uh, we, we, we'd like to have a structured uh, the discussion, so the expert group can be good mean. But one thing that, that I, uh, I'm taking is that the common standard discussion is maybe, maybe serving other purposes. You have, because if you think as an operator, that if you are following a common standard that you will be allowed to offer your products at a country, you are missing uh, the, the clue. That will, be, that, that, that will be not the case. Also, when, when you are uh, following the recommendations of uh, the, the, maybe the recommendations that will come uh, of the European, uh, at European level, and you are following these recommendations that you will be allowed to offer your product, that's also uh, uh, not, not the wise idea. Mm -hmm. So we are not against common standards as a regulator because we have limited resources, so the less work we have on something, uh, the better for us. If we have the, 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 this morning it was clearly mentioned, it's about trust and transparency. And common standards are one element in that decision but it's not the crucial element, uh, the common standard. We, we need to have a sufficient level of control of what's happening in our country in the absence of a European uh, framework in order to protect society and the citizens. So for me, the common standard discussion is welcome. If our operators in Belgium are, are requesting or asking us to do some things about that, we will do it. We will, we will also try to, 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 to follow common standards but uh, we are not seeing that these questions and they you see we have uh, other uh, we have uh, italian operators we have uh, 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 french operators also uh, delivering activities in other countries and it's not it's a, it's can be a good thing for them if there would be common standards but it's not the main problem for them they can organize their businesses in a profitable way even within in, in the absence of common standards so it's it, it depends on uh, what exactly is the aim of the of, of the discussion can I, 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, we are talking about common standards, but then we have the, the EGBA standards, the SEN standards, the IAGAR e-gambling group standards. So, what standards do we take? So, that, that probably the European Commission, as Peter was saying, uh, is the best place to try to do something because they have uh, all the 28 regulators, they have a very good relationship with the associations, with, uh, with all the stakeholders of this, this industry. So, Sorry to interrupt there, but we all know the, the timescales involved operating Europe as opposed to commercial timescales are, exactly, are that's the problem. a step change apart. That's aren't the they? problem. So I don't see any real solution. Another one could be we take two countries that are similar. I don't know Spain and France because they're not here. They work <laughs> between them and find what uh, do some benchmarking uh, between uh, those two standards. So then we can replicate this with a third country, UK, and so on. So try to, uh, let's say, a bottom-up approach. Otherwise, it's, it's really complicated. Martin, you want no, to I think for us, uh, well, I mean, I speak, of course, on behalf of the EGBA members, and we have our EGBA standards. I think you're more than willing to give up the EGBA standards for the SEN standards. For us, that would be the benchmark, clearly. Uh, we actually amended our EGBA standards to encompass the SEN standards. Uh, and if it would help the discussion, I think for us, primarily it would be <coughs> the sense and it should be uh, the, the, the benchmark uh, to use. Um, and so, you know, and, I, and just in reply to what, what Peter said, um, I think for us, it be common standards doesn't mean that uh, we consider that national law doesn't apply anymore. I think if you, know, if you talk about sure. trust and confidence, I think hopefully you not take it negatively, but positively, we don't say that therefore national law doesn't apply anymore. Of course, we have our own views <coughs> on certain elements in national law, but I don't think that the discussion on standards, we don't want to confuse it with a discussion on which law does actually apply and how do we need to interpret it. So I think hopefully as well, I can take a bit of a uh, maybe mistrust away there that this is not the intention of talking about common standards. Stefano, if you could comment on that, and then we'll, we're running low on time, so we'll move on to yeah. liquidity as well. I will comment very briefly. I wear my hat of a lawyer again. <laughs> and I say that I think that we shall start from uh, a, a work that is challenging the standards with the European treaty principles. Is what has happened in the, in the last decade <coughs> somehow. Whenever there was a problem, every, the, the last uh, uh, decision was interpreting the Court of Justice decisions. So why don't we do that in advance instead of going through the whole process to get there? No? Let's make this uh, attempt. Regulators are key. Operators are key as well. And I feel that with the present competence of regulators and operators, uh, this can be reached without uh, uh, incredible timing. Okay, looking at liquidity then, I think certainly having discussions in the last uh, couple of days around the floor and with members of the panel earlier, a lot of us think there is no issue about rolling out international liquidity relatively easily and quickly. Um, is, is that something that can be done easily, Francesco, Peter? I mean, could turn to Francesco first. Is there anything that would be stopping Italy turning around and saying, international liquidity across the board, no dramas, let's get on with it? And if not, what are your caveats? Well, it's obvious that uh, uh, increasing the liquidity brings advantages. The problem is that once, uh, for, I, as, I'm looking at this uh, from the Italian perspective, when we launched poker, for instance, we decided, it was decided that at the political level that the liquidity had to be ring-fenced. So now, we have the option to extend the liquidity by uh, joining another jurisdiction. But that's the issue. We, it takes at least two countries to have shared liquidity. We cannot do it on our own. <laughs> and uh, we've been uh, discussing this since uh, a long time ago, but so far I, I don't know why we are still stuck at the starting point. 
Can you just shake hands with Peter now and agree that at least Belgium and um, Italy should have shared liquidity? We could organise it this afternoon. Well, as a, as a mid-sized country, we were, we were confronted with the situation that we have to allow international liquidity. Other, uh, there was no uh, real alternative. There is, for instance, for poker, we, we had to allow international liquidity. Otherwise, the player cannot play uh, when he uh, wants to play. So, but I think uh, liquidity can be a driving factor in the, fu in, 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 in the future. I don't think that it will be a driving factor if you start a discussion about illegal uh, operators and who is illegal in, 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 in a country and, and, and also in another country. But I think if you are, I, I said in the beginning that you have to build further on experiences in member states. And I can imagine, for instance, with Italy or also with other countries, maybe with 10 countries, because then it's becoming more interesting. Uh, I think you can, uh, when you uh, start from uh, the points that you have to allow in your country so that you are authorized in that country and that you share liquidity with an authorized operator uh, in another country and that's the decision of that member state who is allowed or not that you can come to, 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 to agreements but you have to avoid a discussion of the, the, like also more say, about illegal or not and then I think uh, maybe there are possibilities but it has to be big enough to, to, to implement uh, it's between uh, two states or, or three states, maybe it will be not so easy to, to implement. And therefore, I think it's a good initiative that the major countries have come together, but I don't think that you find uh, your solutions with five countries. I think you have to, maybe the third countries should be a bit more interesting. So, and then it could be a driving factor, yes. I, I'm very aware that time is getting, so I'm going to turn to the audience now while we still can. Anyone in the audience have got any questions from members of our panel? Nothing, nothing. Okay, then very quickly, just to finish off, very quick yes or no answer. What's going to come first? Common standards harmonization or international liquidity? Morton. International liquidity makes a lot of sense from also from a self-interest perspective. So I'm not giving you a short answer, I know. But it just, just saying that, that I don't understand from a political level why Italy is not allowing it. They're allowing big pool lotteries. That's basically the same. It's just the technical uh, uh, things may be different, but those can be overcome. So, so it's clear. Let's say liquidity. Liquidity. Francesca? To share liquidity, you must also share some standards because it's necessary for the system to work. So they will come at the same time. Sorry. I don't know when. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go for the common standards first, then liquidity, and then harmonization in the long run. Egg per drafted common standards. Yeah. Preferably. Yes, common standards first. Uh, liquidity is also a fiscal problem. So either we, we create a pot <laughs> where we put all the hypothetical taxation and then the 27 member states could share it or it will be difficult. Peter? For me, uh, international liquidity is already there, so it's uh, <laughs> international liquidity. <laughs> yes, you're right. So there we have it. Um, it appears that harmonization is no longer a word we're going to be using. We're going to move to common standards, and Morton's going to lead it on behalf of both the regulator and the industry. So. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you very much, Morton, Francesco, Martin, Stefano, Peter, and thank you for listening. <coughs>